Occasionally, there had been a muffled thud or deadened explosion within the ship. Now, without warning, she seemed to start forward, moving forward and into the water at an angle of about 15 degrees. This movement, with the water rushing up toward us, was accompanied by a rumbling roar, mixed with more muffled explosions. It was like standing under a steel railway bridge while an express train passes overhead, mingled with the noise of a pressed steel factory and the wholesale breakage of China. Her deck was turned slightly toward us. We could see groups of the almost 1,500 people aboard, clinging in clusters or bunches like swarming bees, only to fall in masses, pairs, or singly, as the great part of the ship, 250 feet of it, rose into the sky till it reached a 65 or 70 degree angle. Here it seemed to pause and just hung for what felt like minutes. Gradually, she turned her deck away from us, as though to hide from our sight the awful spectacle. Because I had known Ismay so well on board the Titanic, the doctor of the Carpathia, the afternoon that we approached New York, asked me if I would not visit Mr. Ismay in his cabin and talk to him, to see if I could help relieve the terribly nervous condition he was in. I immediately went down, and as there was no answer to my knock, I went right in. He was seated, in his pajamas, on his bunk, staring straight ahead, shaking all over like a leaf. My entrance apparently did not dawn on his consciousness. Even when I spoke to him and tried to engage him in conversation, telling him he had a perfect right to take the last boat, he paid absolutely no attention and continued to look ahead with his fixed stare. I am almost certain that on the Titanic, his hair had been black with slight tinges of gray, but now his hair was virtually snow white. I have never seen a man so completely wrecked. Nothing I could do or say brought any response. As I closed the door, he was still looking fixedly ahead. Probably a minute passed with almost dead silence and quiet. Then an individual call for help from here, from there, gradually swelling into a composite volume of one long continuous wailing chant from the 1500 in the water all around us. It sounded like locusts on a midsummer night in the woods in Pennsylvania. This terrible continuing cry lasted for 20 or 30 minutes, gradually dying away as one after another could no longer withstand the cold and the exposure. Practically no one was drowned as no water was found in the lungs of those later recovered. Everyone had on a life preserver the partially filled lifeboat standing by only a few hundred yards away never came back. Why on earth they didn't is a mystery. How could any human being fail to heed those cries? They were afraid the boats would be swamped by the people in the water. There was peace, and the world had an even tenor to its way. Nothing was revealed in the morning the trend of which was not known the night before. It seems to me that the disaster about to occur was the event that not only made the world rub its eyes and awake, but woke it with a start, keeping it moving at a rapidly accelerating pace ever since with less and less peace, satisfaction, and happiness. To my mind, the world of today awoke April 15, 1912.